thanks so much. So um, one of the things that uh, Kira didn't mention is I also was an early board member of Startup Weekend. Um, how many people have been to a Startup Weekend? Nobody. Oh, a couple people. Kira's been to two. Um, so Startup Weekend is from idea to revenue in 54 hours. So I have, out of my efforts, gone to 60 Startup Weekends. I facilitate them as a, as a hobby, apparently. Um, and so um, I have this bias towards action. And one of the things that I notice with most of the startups is that one of the things that they do is they waste a lot of energy and time by trying to figure things out instead of trying to take actions that teach them things. So my whole point for being here now early is to try to give you a specific bias towards action so that you can be profitable by the time Christmas gets here. Um, if I can get 40% of a startup weekend team uh, to revenue in two days, surely in three weeks, four weeks, you can have a serious heartbeat of something if you think about it right. So the beginning of that thinking about it right is uh, the Lean Canvas, and the Lean Canvas is a very specific take on this business model process. Before I dive into that, I'd like to get a little bit about who's in the room so that I can focus things a little bit. So Mike, could you say who you are, why you're here, and what you do in less than 15 seconds, and then we'll go around the room. That does what? Okay. What's the company do? Okay. Okay. Google what? Google Clip. What's Google Clip? That's where you come up with your ideas. That does what? Machining, machine learning makes your phone take pictures fast. All right, there you go, clips. All right, so <coughs> notice that when I asked you what you do, that almost everybody told me the what of their company, not the benefit that their company provides to their customer. And that's a habit that people have. I would like to help change that as well. So let's dive in the hard way. I think that, yeah, good. How do I stay out of your way and still, I guess I'll stand here. So in 2003, Steve Blank came up with this notion of the four steps to the epiphany. Um, basically, the primary point of that is that customer development precedes product development. So how many of you have started with a product? Oh, come on, all your hands should go up because all of you talked to me about how you had an idea and or invention and a thing and probably have not yet talked to enough customers. So customers are people who pay you. How many people who pay you have you talked to? No, none of them are paying you. You have no income. What was the question again? How many people who have paid you have you talked to? Okay, so 
that's the specific place I would like to keep people focused. How do I know that the people that I'm talking to are customers? And how do I then engage enough of them to see the big picture of what they care about so that I can go forward with that? So his four steps that he talks about in his epiphany are discovery, validation, creation, and scale. When I talk to people about those things, people don't know how to translate those into action. Yeah? So, go discover a customer. What are you going to do? Uh, go out on the street and talk to random people. And talk to random people and have no point, throw spaghetti to the wall, see what happens. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you could come up with some medical. Anybody here a scientist trained in science? How many of you take uh, your scientific experiments and throw random ingredients into the pot and see what happens? Never do it, right? You always start with a? Hypothesis. Why didn't you start with a hypothesis? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> ah, all right. <coughs> so, in order to frame this, there's a there's a guy named a a Osterwalder. Boy, that's a terrible uh, layout. I uh, changed anyway. Um, guy named Alexander Osterwalder uh, did a, a book called the Business Model Generation Book. Um, and he has this business model generation canvas, which I think is very useful, but is a little bit more general on around what is it that my business does. And so Ash Moria tried to run a bunch of experiments using the business model canvas and found that it just didn't work for him. And so he sort of started replacing things inside that, ended up coming with this. And so there are um, 12 boxes, and we'll get into the details of the boxes, but we're trying to identify some of the core pieces of your business. Now, some of the important things about your business are missing from this, like the number one thing that causes businesses to fail is? The, uh, th that's a good instinct. That's number two. Um, number one is the team can't play nice with each other. And so businesses are big enough that you have to have a team, and if you have a team that doesn't know how to play their part of the, the game field, then everything falls apart. 62% of the companies fail because the team can't play. 42% of the companies fail because nobody wants your product. No customers. So what do I do with that canvas? Let's be more concrete than he was. Our goal is to do a bunch of build, measure, learn loops, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, exactly. So we want to take little tiny bites and move really fast. And when I talk to most people that are trained in Scrum or Agile, and I talk about really fast, they say, oh, we do fast. We have two-week schedules. Two-week schedules, three-week schedules, four-month schedules. When I do startup weekends and I try to drive a startup weekend, I do 90-minute schedules. So I try to get 90-minute cycle times where we do stand-ups every 90 minutes. It's a little bit intense because it's trying to drive home a particular behavior. But if you were doing a long-term sprint, four-hour experiments seem reasonable. How many people is a lot of people to call in a day? How many engineers in the room? One, two, two that are willing to admit it. All right, so how, how many of you feel like calling five people is a lot of people? 10 people, 50 people. Yeah, so a good salesperson is doing between 50 and 75 phone calls a day trying to find customers. And if they close five, they're doing very good, right? And so you have to figure out how to get that volume to make that work. And the way to do that, in my mind, is to write a hypothesis and engage in this, build a test to test the hypothesis, call a bunch of people or see a bunch of people and try to get to yes or no. So how do we do that? We'll talk about that some more. So <coughs> part of our assumption is that you have a traction model that's got an exponential curve on it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that exponential curve. And we want to get the vision of what you're doing figured out in some kind of three-year period. But to do something about that, we're really doing a lot of build, measure, learn loops really fast. And you notice that Ash's assumption about what fast means three weeks I feel is a long cycle, right? So right now, what do you know about your company? Almost nothing. That's exactly what startups are doing. 
they are a entity in search of a business, not a business. And so they have to run around and touch a whole bunch of different pieces of the swamp to see which pieces stay above the water. And the only way to do that is to go put your finger in a bunch of places in the swamp fast. So looking at these 12 boxes, this is the lean canvas. Uh, hmm. um, so <coughs> when, I, when I have people go through the lean canvas, customer problem solution, unique value proposition, unfair advantage, customer channels, key metrics, existing alternatives, early adopters, high level concepts, expenses and revenue, then everybody's head goes because it's just too many things to pay attention to. So which experiment could I do that would be useful? Where should I start? <coughs> I think that we need to do a little bit of origami. So if we take that lean canvas a little bit, I got to turn around, take the lean canvas, fold it up and do customer problem, uh, early adopters and existing uh, alternatives. So do you as someone who has a startup, have a spreadsheet, which is a detailed list of all of the existing alternatives of what people do today, what features are on that list, and what people think about each of those features. Uh, like, is this a, a required feature? Is this a nice to have, but if I didn't have it, it wouldn't cause me not to buy it? Kind of list. How many people have that competitive matrix for their company now? Zero. That also turns out to be the core of your content strategy. At the very, very beginning of a startup is a customer with a problem. And they have a problem and they do something today and what they do today, what they type into Google today or being if you're on the other side of the water, um, is the thing that they're trying to scratch that itch and you're trying to find a person that you can scratch their itch and the way that they find you is through content and the content comes from your competitive matrix spreadsheet. And you then can come to a deep understanding of your existing alternatives. If you are in a startup in a business, you are an ex expert in that problem. And the first thing that you do as a PhD student is, we have some grad students here, what do grad students do? The first thing you do after you're deciding your thesis, you do a, a survey of the field and look at what everybody else has already written about this stuff so that I know what it is and I become an expert on what they've already said so that I can tell them what they don't know yet. That's what we're doing in a startup is that level of a survey of the field to understand what that is. At the same time, we want to go talk to a bunch of people and gather up a bunch of early adopters and find out what they need and what they need badly enough to pay me money now, right? Any thoughts about that before we go? So I would claim that when we talk about customer discovery, what we're really talking about is custom problem fit. So we should start with customer and the problems that the customers have and listen to their top three problems. Got any problems, Lee? Uh, not a great fit yet. Really? You're the first person that has no problems at all, yeah. So product, market, fit is the process of having a thing that the market wants to buy now. It's like step three and a half, four. And when you say, oh, I'm going to start my thing. I have a great idea. I'm going to build the MVP and then we're going to get product market fit. You just skipped over the three most important things to do. For example, you don't have your competitive matrix and then you have to backfill your competitive matrix and your salespeople can't do their job and you don't have a narrative because you've been waiting to talk about your product because you don't have it built yet, so you have no audience. So there's a whole bunch of work to be done in the building up of the customers so that when you have a product that's ready, that they actually buy it rather than building the thing and then saying, hey, anybody want this? Again, 42% of businesses fail because the answer says anybody want this is no. So product market fit, I would claim is somewhere about step two, uh, 3.5. So problem, customer fit, prob customer problem fit, I will call that discovery. And, it, and that makes that more concrete. 
make me a list of 100 people who said, yes, I have the problem. Yes, I'm willing to pay you money to solve that problem. Did I say the word solution in there anywhere? So this is not about talking about your favorite invention, your favorite prob uh, problem um, scratcher. It's only about listening to them saying, I have a problem. So it's everybody in the room got 100 people with their phone number, email address, and yes, I have this problem on a list in a spreadsheet somewhere. No, I'm hearing a zero. Somebody surely has it. All right, well, so I would urge you to start there. The next step in my mind is if you got a pile of people with the problem and you say, hey, out of all of these alternatives, does this new solution I have scratch your itch better than the other people's stuff? Then now you're searching for problem solution fit. Now the problem is that problem solution fit doesn't mean that I have something that's 10% better than everything else. Why not? Right, the effort in most people's minds to change their behavior is substantial. So even though going down the street another couple of blocks to go to a different store to say 10%, I know this store, I go in this store, right? <coughs> so you have to have like factors of 10 difference for people to change their behavior. Certainly factors of two difference to get people to change their behavior. How many people have changed their behavior in the last day or two in a way that they've noticed? None of you, right? Oh, one. What did you do? Uh, I went to check my memory because my first uh, problem solution was like coming in from work at 3 a.m. Yeah, <laughs> and there you did. And <laughs> you learned something coming in that you bang. All right. Good. <laughs> so that, that's a good one, actually. So for the most part, we don't change our behavior. For the most part, we do what we did before, and we think about other things. So your product must cause people to want it more than they want to keep doing what they're already doing. So you're going to have to figure out what that is. And the way you find that out, again, is talking to customers and hearing them tell you what's important about the product that you've got, what's not important, which pieces of it that you think are super special, that they think, if you have that, I will not buy your product, and figure out what is exactly the solution they care about. And more importantly, there are like 7.5 billion solution or markets of size one which is exactly not what you want. You want to get a market that's got a big size to it, so you have to find many people that want the same thing. 